I know that's an odd title, but we're going to start this morning with three readings of Scripture, beginning first in Luke 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The second reading is Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The final reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, first of all, think about the Sabbath. In Exodus, God sets the observance of the Sabbath in terms of his own creative activity. You rest on the seventh day because God rested. He finished his creation and rested on the seventh day. After all, God says, I created the world in six days, and it was perfect. And he sort of asked the question, do you think you're going to do a better job than me if you just keep working and working and working and working? Do you think that if you keep on working until you finally drop that you're going to best me? Do you think that you're going to add something significant to the world that I have already created to my satisfaction? And I think God is reflecting here the, the, that kind of human tendency we have to think that if I could just work a little longer, if I could just work a little harder, if I could just work a little more, I'd get the world the way it was supposed to be, and then everything would be fine. And God said, I've already done that. I did that in six days, and on the seventh day, I rested. The Sabbath is a reminder of human limitations. No matter how hard we work, no matter how much we exhaust ourselves, it will never be perfect. It will never be as good as God has already done. So God says, honor me. Work, yes. Six days, you do your work. But don't think you can do God's job. Your hard work is never going to straighten out the world. You are never going to get it all done. So just humble yourself and let God be God and relax and rest. Then in Deuteronomy, God, Moses sets the observance of the Sabbath, God through Moses sets the observance of the Sabbath in terms of slavery. This, this business of work being drudgery and, and degrading and exhaustion. Rest, he says, on the seventh day because you were once delivered from Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry, because you were once slaves in Egypt. You were driven to work. You were worked to a nub. You were completely worn out. 
and you didn't have any dignity. All you had was the expectation of work. You go to bed at night thinking about work the next day, and you get up thinking about work, and you go to bed thinking about, you eat your meals working. You, you, you don't ever get any rest. You just keep on working, and you had no dignity. All you did was slave day after day. One task ended, another task began, and you were nobodies. You were just tools to be used up and then discarded, to be thrown away when you got too old or too feeble or too hurt or whatever to be used anymore he says stop working you are more than your work your hired servants and even your slaves are more than their work you are all people of dignity and your dignity does not reside in your exhausting labor and he even extends that kind of dignity even to animals. Don't work your ox, don't work your, your, your donkey, all the animals on the farm. And, and, and God is trying to get us to see something about the value of life, that life is more than the things that we do. Life is more than the work that we perform. But notice, however, how both of those are considered, both in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, they are considered to be a Sabbath to the Lord your God. God is not saying, rest on the seventh day because you need some leisure time. Rest on the seventh day because you need to recuperate. Neither Moses nor God says, look, you need to take some time off so you can watch a little more TV and just, just kind of relax a little, play a little golf, recuperate, go to the lake, have some fun. There's a place for those things, I'm sure. I, I know there is. I mean, there is a place for rest and relaxation for even godly reasons but this business about the sabbath is not that at all the sabbath is a time to get focused on god it is a time to really stop focusing on what you do and focus on what god has done here we are all week working laboring wearing ourselves out running here and there focusing on our work getting things done what's got to be done next what's got to be done today it's work 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 all the time just look how much I'm getting done. I mean, look how, look how great the world is. Look how, much, look how much I'm not getting done. And God says, stop. Before you work yourself into a frenzy, before you wear yourself out so that you're ready to die, get, get your eyes off of work and put them on me. I am the one who rules the world. I created it. I rescued you from slavery so you could enjoy it. So I, need, I want you to focus. Get, get your work back in its rightful place. I want you to work, yes. That in the very beginning, God created the, the Garden of Eden. And what's the first thing he did? He put man in it and said, here, work here. Work is important. Work is a big thing. But I bless you beyond your work, God says. And I bless you in your work. And even when you're asleep, God rules the world. And so God says, just stop and let me be God so that a significant amount or a significant element of the, res of the Sabbath is not recreation, but it's worship. It's, it's getting God back in the right place where God is, ought to be honored and where God is to be followed. Now, let's think about what's going on in Luke. Jesus comes to Martha's house, and Luke makes it pretty clear that Martha is the head of the household. And just the way he tells the story, Martha is the one who receives Jesus into her house. And Mary is mentioned only directly. Martha had a sister named Mary, and that's, that's a real indirect way of, of pointing toward Mary. It is to Martha that all of the responsibilities of hospitality fall. And Martha is being a responsible hostess. I, I get this picture of her hustling and bustling around, and, and I don't know what all she's doing, preparing food. Maybe she, she throws on a shawl and runs out to the market to get the food that she needs for the meal that they're about to have to eat. After all, they don't have refrigerators and freezers and all that kind of stuff, you know, and it, it's got to be bought day by day. And certainly she's cooking and she's arranging things and getting it ready. Maybe she's moving furniture or sweeping up and dusting. You know, I've watched women before. Company is coming. What do you do? Boy, you get this house straightened up, and you get everything ready, and they start working themselves to death to put their best foot forward to make it a welcoming, warm place for Jesus, her love, her Lord. 
and she wants it to be right. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, Martha crossed the line. Her service, rather than being a joyful and gracious reception of Jesus, has crossed over into resentment and anger. Uh, Jesus describes her attitude down in verse 41. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset, he says, about many things. And that word that's translated upset there in the New International Version is usually a word that's used of crowds who are rioting. And so uh, the picture I get of Martha is, is here she is in this kitchen and she's clinking these pots and pans as she prepares the meal and the clinking and the clanking gets louder as she begins to set them down a little bit harder and gritting her teeth she begins to slam them down on the stove and, and, and she's slamming things around in the kitchen and when you see her appear at the door of the kitchen she's glowering at Mary and maybe even grumbling and growling as she walks around and the furniture doesn't just slide across the floor screeches across the floor as she lets people know here I am moving this furniture and I'm doing all of these things until finally she came to him that is a real tame translation of the Greek she stood over them it's a really intensive form of the word stand and here I see Martha looming over Jesus with Mary at his feet listening and she I, I get a picture of her holding this big wooden spoon with a big pot in her hand on the other side and she's trembling with anger as she stands over Jesus and says Lord and you can hear the hurt and the vexation and the anger in her voice is it nothing to you that my sister has left me to serve all alone tell her to help me now think about that for a second Lord, Lord, what is your will? Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, here's how it's going to be. Lord, you do what I say right now. Lord, here I am working my fingers to the bone, trying to do something nice for you, and here you are with Mary lying at your feet, leaving me alone to get everything done, and you don't even care. And I see her shake her dripping spoon at him. Tell her to help me right now. And Jesus responds. Martha, whoops, sorry. Martha, Martha. Uh, that, by the way, is not a chewing out. Uh, my mother, when she was chewing me out, would call me David Glenn Lowe. Never, never anything but David Glenn Lowe. And I knew that was the signal. Martha, Martha is a term of, indif is, uh, it's, it's a term of endearment. Martha, oh, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things but few things are needed or indeed only one and you need to hear that Jesus is not criticizing her for being a domestic instead of being a serious disciple here's Mary lying at the feet of Jesus she is the real disciple you're only in there making food that's not it at all he is not criticizing her for focusing on household chores while there are more important things available, like listening to preaching. He is not saying that study is better than service. I mean, Martha, if you think about it, Martha is doing exactly what the Samaritan did in the preceding parable. The parable of the Good Samaritan is what just directly precedes this parable. Martha has gone out of her way and is taking care to receive Jesus and to meet his needs. But she's doing it the same way James and John wanted to blow up a Samaritan village when, they didn't, when that the village did not receive Jesus. And so here is Martha starting, I think, with the right impulse to, to receive Jesus. That's disciple language. She is receiving Jesus as her Lord 
and she wants to take care of him as one who loves God and, and probably even loves her neighbor. But the work was heavy, and the burden was heavy, and the work was long. And every time Martha passed by the living room, she pushes that lock of sweaty hair up out of her face, and all she can see is Mary sitting there at the feet of Jesus, and her anger and irritation grows, as she wishes she were out there too, but somebody's going to get all this work done, until finally it overwhelmed her good impulses, and now she towers over Jesus, telling her Lord what to do, and wishing she could call down fire and burn up Mary. Ah, Martha, you're worried and throwing a fit about a lot of things. You know, Martha, you don't have to put on a 12-course meal. And it's okay if the windowsills are a little dusty. And it's all right that the floor could stand a little sweeping, perhaps. But few things are necessary. Really, only one. I think Jesus tells Martha, Martha, a sandwich would have been enough. Mary, he says, has chosen what is better, and it will be not be taken away from her. There, there's a rebuke of Martha here, all right, and, and it ought not to be ignored. We need to hear it. Martha, Jesus says, what I want is you, not an amazing meal. And Martha, you need me too. Just, just look at where you are, worried and upset angry at Mary, put out with me. Martha, just slap a couple of pieces of bread together with some bologna and let's talk for a while. And there's the point, I think. You can't be a disciple and just focus on one side of the equation. You can't love God and not love your neighbor. That's, that's the Good Samaritan parable. But you can't love your neighbor without loving God, and that's the story of Martha and Mary. There is a time to stop all of that frenzied activity and sit down and listen and learn and let Jesus shape your heart. And here we are back to Exodus and Deuteronomy, aren't we? Where God says there is a time to work. Six days, you will do all your work. And then there's a time to worship. The seventh is a day of worship. It's a Sabbath to your God. There is a time for service in practical ways. And here is Martha bustling around in the kitchen, showing her love for Jesus, and that's great. And then there is a time to sit at Jesus' feet. Mary is hanging on his every word. And you can't have the one without the other. If you try to do the one love your neighbor without the love of God and the love of Christ, then you're just going to blow up and wear out because you're going to be doing it the hard way. And you can't love God without showing the care and the concern for your neighbors as well. My mother, my mother was as domestic a woman as I think I ever knew. Uh, she was my dad's wife. There was no doubt about it. She, she was proud of that. That was, her, that was her place. That was who she was. She was her children's mother. And she let us know several times in unspeakable tones that she was our mother. And there was no doubt about that. And for as long as I can remember, she laid out three sumptuous meals every day, including Saturday and Sunday. And for breakfast, there would be eggs and bacon and toast or eggs and bacon and biscuits and gravy or eggs and ham and biscuits. My, whatever my dad was in the mood for, that's what mom fixed. But it was always, always a, a marvelous, marvelously well-cooked and a lot of food. At other meals, we'd have meat. Usually, we'd have potatoes. We would have vegetables. We would have bread. And there would always be a dessert that she had cooked. She did the dishes. She, I can count the times that my brother and I ever did dishes probably on one hand. She washed the clothes. She cleaned house. I, the house was spick and span. It wasn't unlivable. It wasn't like she was just freaky and crazy about it, but it was always clean. 
And when she finally got fed up with the squalor, she even came into my room and cleaned it up as well. Uh, she was known by everybody as the expert domestic engineer she was. What a wonderful homemaker she is, they would say. A real Martha, although they never really realized exactly what they were saying. They intended that as a compliment and not an insult. And they never realized how she used that devotion to household things as a ministry for Jesus. My friends ate at her table. I, I don't remember ever eating a single time at somebody else's house. They all came to mind. Every member of the church in Lovington cycled through that house at one time or another. That, that spick and span, well-organized home, warm and inviting and hospitable. Needy people knew her skill. Widows and the sick and the grieving received regular meals from her kitchen. And at any church where mom and dad ever lived for any length of time, she was the center of hospitality and she was gracious and, and they knew her loving care. And the churches where she was were always known as friendly, outgoing, accepting, and caring fellowships. I wonder why that was. She was a nice, caring person. Ah, I wish I had that sort of personality. <laughs> you understand it's not personality? They never heard her praying. They never watched her reading. They never paid much attention to the fact that she was at worship every time she could be there. And she sang hymns while she washed dishes. And she prayed over her dirty clothes. And she delighted that Jesus was pleased when she cooked and when people enjoyed what she shared with them. You see, it was just so hard to untangle her love for Jesus from her love for others. Let's stand and let's sing, please. If you need to come to Jesus, please come.